Hi, I'm writing this because I never got any sort of debrief or moment to decompress from a job I quit in February of 2018. I worked for an agency that dealt with issues related to non-human intelligence. Sometimes these were referred to as EBEs, or as a friend lovingly called them, AES. I can't divulge what I did specifically. Most of the information I'm going to discuss is anecdotal information I found out about from colleagues. This is because it would be easy to identify me from what my role was. As the information I can say about what I did specifically would be personally identifying. Feel free to dismiss my post as a hoax entirely. I know the right people will believe me. I'm posting this for myself to make peace with the gravity, no pun intended, of the situation. I tried VA and independent therapy, but divulging this sort of information to a hipster trained in active listening probably wouldn't go well. Posting here is a last resort, but I hope I'm welcome to discuss what I can. I'll first talk about my career history, what working for the agency is like, how it functions, and then my general thoughts. If my post makes it past moderation, I'll answer as many questions as I can. I'm unwilling to post an ID privately to moderators or otherwise. None. People who did that face consequences. I don't think those people were Reddit leakers specifically. But any act to talk about the information in any meaningful way outside of the chain of command ends badly. I'd rather be accused of making things up than risk that because I simply don't care what people think of me. Hopefully my post will clear up why. I'm currently a university professor, not at the university my username would lead you to believe. I was inspired to write this post when one of my students referred to me as verbatim a dude who has to know about aliens. If only he knew that wasn't even the start of it. I graduated from college in the early 90s with a degree in something I'm passionate about but never used. I started my career as an assistant for a mechanical engineer at an aerospace contractor I got after working some connections I had. Entry-level contractor jobs are easier to get than you may think. Well, maybe not if you posted here. I eventually was a project manager overseeing a small team working on experimental aircraft. Over the course of my career in aviation, I worked at three different contractors. I was on some of the teams working in autonomous flight in Nevada, among other places. I'll share two major things I noticed that, looking back, could be related to NHI research. It was a sort of open secret I was let in on at some point in the late 90s that if a large-scale invasion or threat to the mainland U.S. were to materialize, the U.S. had an ultimate trump card of sorts that would render everything we were working on as completely obsolete. Jokes like, well, work smarter, not harder on X, because if it were to come down to it, we wouldn't use that technology anyway. Weren't uncommon. I assume this was referring to nukes. Later, I spent time doing inspections at various secret facilities due to my standing in particular agencies. If I'm identified, I will definitely lose that standing, so there's that. This was not as exciting as it sounds. It was very technical and boring. I was mostly just a glorified HVAC inspector. I visited a handful of facilities, but two of them in particular stood out as there were areas within them I wasn't allowed to access. At the first facility, the scope of my job was to inspect the entire location. One area had its own security who, after a long discussion, basically told me to kick rocks. My boss wasn't authorized to let me through either. I wrote a scathing report about this incident in my overall assessment of the facility, and my boss erased it from the document entirely. The situation at the second facility was similar. I'll admit I was what I guess the my students call a Karen about it. I knew that whoever was operating these areas was working completely out side of congressional regulation, which, while it does happen in certain sectors, is really not a good look. Once I got the job I'm talking about, I was able to confirm the second facility was related to NHI research. I was never able to confirm the first was. After a teaching stint, I was offered an interview for a position in my project management routes, again, near where I was living at the time. I wasn't told what I would be working on, which isn't uncommon. I was excited to get back to work because I had been working on goal-oriented drone swarms in my free time and assumed that's what the interview would be for. The interview took place in a skiff in someone's house. Looking back, this was most likely a house that wasn't lived in, but just used for the purpose of interviewing potential hires without giving away the location. It's also likely this was the location because this agency doesn't exist in any official capacity. Yes, it has a name. It gets sort of kind of funding. Saying the name would get me killed. I, I wish I were exaggerating. I was told the name uh, at the start of the interview, and I had never heard of it before. I've never even said the name out loud.
Paradoxically, even though the agency doesn't exist, if someone knew the name, it's likely a paper trail exists through publicly available documents. A lot of the information isn't classified because the agency is so secretive. Going through the process to classify it in the first place would reveal it to too many people. In past interviews, particularly for the inspection job, I could refer to specific colleagues, facilities I worked at, or contractors I was in good standing with to play the usual interview game. In this interview, I was treated like a brand new hire. While I was already offended about how I was being treated, the interviewer started grilling me about my love for Star Trek and said that theatrics wouldn't fly in the position I was being interviewed for. Looking back, I should have never accepted the job, but the allure of working on swarms was too great. The first office I worked at was an office building that didn't stand out in any way at all. I believe our neighbors in the office park were a fashion studio and a dentist, among others. The difference was our building had 24 sevenths armed security. The first few days were heavy paperwork and onboarding. One of my old bosses called me on an office phone to talk to me before I was officially onboarded. As a management nerd, the biggest challenge of working for this agency is that it's a paperless office. It has its own highly sophisticated intranet with hundreds of archival documents. The implication was that unless it absolutely had to be saved to never, ever write anything down. I remember an early colleague telling me a Gantt chart is a great way to get fired. This was a challenge at first, remembering all of the information with no documentation is not something I'm particularly built for, especially when the information is about NHI. Later, I worked in a facility within a facility just like the one I had tried to inspect. It stored a craft. Being near the craft for extended periods of time is extremely dangerous, especially if it is being experimented on with power. I didn't observe any injuries to anyone while I was there, but all sorts of long-term nasty injuries were relayed to me through rumors and warnings. The craft was shaped like a dreidel without the handle. There was a large exterior piece that went missing when it was recovered. The theory is it acted as a stabilizer, although some argue it was a crude weapon. It sat in a custom hydraulic rig that could be used to rotate it into all sorts of different positions, kind of like those aero trim astronaut training balls where they spin you around. I wasn't on the team that got to use the rotation rig. The rig was so large and extensive, I spent a few weeks thinking it was part of the craft before someone told me otherwise. Typically, the craft would held on its side in the rig for easier storage. Its weight just naturally sat it that way, although it was intended to be flown vertically. The shape was directly informed by its purpose. Every shape is custom molded in a metallic material that would revolutionize the way we travel if we had it. In following the topic as much as I can manage to, I've seen some other people mention the material. There were some material scientists that had been working there for, for decades. I never got to go inside the craft. It was guarded 24-7. Boy, did I want to look. The agency goes out of its way to hire individuals who have little interest in working in this space at all. They recruit particularly out of BYU, although you have to have a contractor or government career for around a decade to be considered for an interview. Published uh, papers don't hurt. When I worked at the second facility, the sorts of people that were there were frustrating to interact with because my initial reaction to working in the, that facility was extreme excitement and it wasn't shared. I believe this is partially responsible for the stagnation, high turnover rate, and compartmentalization. I quickly learned who to trust and gained some enormous that helped my work. Part of why I'm being secretive about my ID is because the turnover rate results in a sort of summer camp work environment. It's easy to point to classes of people in various non-leadership positions that all were hired, fired, or quit at similar times. If I said when I started, ended, and where I worked, I'd be easily identifiable because there are so few people that match my description. Leadership has been there forever. No, not literally. The agency is divided up into several wings, not unlike the executive, legislative, and judicial branches. I'm not insinuating they're a shadow government, but the wings check and balance each other in a way a government is at least designed to. These wings include mechanical engineering, biologic research, weapons research, computer science, tracking, what I'll call anthropology, what I'll call crash recovery, because that's what colleagues who are planning to come forward will call it, and security. I'll list some information about each. There are definitely more wings that 
that I don't know about. What's unique is these subgroups exist all as part of different parent government organizations and are HQ'd where their parent agencies are. For example, the tracking wing is sort of kind of embedded as R&D at NORAD. This is a simplification of the actual paperwork involved. It's honestly complicated, and I don't know much about how it works. I do know that this is how they maintain funding even when the parent agency goes completely dark for stretches of time. It's worth mentioning that these departments employ, at most, 50 people each. It's typically much lower than that. This is why we're all pushing for whistleblower protection. It's not hard to identify us because there are so few of us in the first place. Mechanical engineering is exactly what it sounds like. It's the most extensive, the oldest, and the most compartmentalized. We have crash craft in various states of complete. We had a recovered craft that worked almost perfectly that was shot down by ourselves. I saw this coming, and it's part of why I quit. There's a lot of information about this wing in the public sphere. Part of their job is to determine what each shape of craft is used for. This is an important job because we're unsure of NHI's intentions. If we discover the designs are intended to hurt us, action will have to be taken. I don't know what that means in practice, but it's what the engineers mostly study. Consider this lecture around the 10-minute mark about the differing characteristics of an F-22 versus a passenger plane. Now imagine figuring out the purpose of the passenger plane versus the F-22. Since we're humans, and those are human designs, eventually a team could figure it out. It's not as easy when the designs aren't for us, or purposes we fully understand. Triangles are the most impressive design, and we don't have one. It's likely China does. Leadership is mad about that. This team discovered a long time ago that the reason why craft appear so bright to us humans is because it's not really light, but rather the product of the crazy amounts of power these craft require. Sort of like smoke coming out of an exhaust pipe. Biology is something I personally suck at. Even at the high school level, I can say the NHI look like the aliens from Close Encounters. As far as I know, we never had one alive. My source who told this was unsure if it was true or not. I didn't learn much about this wing. It's the most secretive. I do know its HQ is hidden in almost plain sight. I still feel like the guy who told me where it is had to be lying because it was just too obvious. There are bodies stored in other locations apart from their main HQ. Weapons research is a large wing and is fairly new. It was absorbed by the Space Force when it, the SF was created. Frustration with the SF as a whole is part of why I left shortly before it started. I don't know much about it. It has a high turnover rate and is dangerous to work in. People were injured and compensated by a large private aerospace contractor instead of the USG. Its main job is to strap a nuke to a reverse engineered craft and just see what the hell happens. Computer science is, or was, it may have moved after I left, HQ'd at a facility in my home state. This is rare because most of the other wings are within a stone's throw of D.C. or Nevada. This is mostly based around researching the craft's navigation system. The navigation in every craft is the same. The craft use a system that originally befuddled generations of researchers, but it's essentially a 3D Dijkstra algorithm. It finds points around the craft and chooses the most efficient possible route through space-time to get to that point. Some of the parameters it uses to gauge efficiency are totally unknown to us and are a serious point of contention. It's not autonomy, but rather obstacle avoidance, not unlike what you would see in a self-driving car. But the self-driving car could go through air, space, and water without worrying about what medium it's in. Additionally, the algo accounts for the craft's place in time. I don't think this means that the craft time travel in the way we think they can, but rather go so fast that they experience dilation and can hit objects in the future, and potentially past at their target destination. It's possible they do this on purpose sometimes. I don't know much about the internal programming of the computer or how it actually does any of this. There are a few senior scientists that hold that information dear. One of them jokingly refers to it as IAC, as in C for NHI. I know that he doesn't work with a computer, only a pad of paper and pen. Although the algo is extremely effective, nuclear explosions and experiments somehow interfere with this navigation. Craft particularly avoid Diablo Canyon, even if we put something they really want there. They mostly avoid previous crash sites as well. More on crashes later. You know, speaking of avoidance, tracking, like I mentioned, is or was part of NORAD. The NHI deploy craft of various shapes and sizes all the time. I don't want to claim that they have advanced cloaking techniques, but from what I heard, the tracking department basically is in an eternal game of cat and mouse. They don't have adequate technology to track the transmedium craft.
All I would say on a record is NHI know we can track them and know how to avoid us. They usually avoid detection by going underwater, especially in the case of particularly large, by human measurement, enormous craft. It's interesting that historical UFO designs mimic the design of buildings and vehicles of that time period. Whether this was just humans not being able to reference what the designs look like or a form of mimicry is anyone's guess. Someone in leadership knows the answer, I don't. It's important to note not everyone at NORAD was part of the tracking team, but the tracking team is embedded in NORAD and interfaces with them on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. This leads to scenarios where NORAD will report an object and the tracking team will silently acknowledge but give no explanation. This lead to a catastrophic incident that happened after I left but knew about from a colleague. Supposedly, tracking is being moved to the Space Force to clear up these miscommunications. If I were working there, I would probably be working on that onboarding process. NORAD was moved to Cheyenne not only to protect from a foreign adversary, but also because the facility is uniquely equipped to track NHI craft. The wing I called anthropology is the weirdest one by far. It focuses on a few different things. They originally studied NHI's intentions and culture, if it's possible to call it that. The reports I read from this early research change the way I see the world. Anthropology and computer science were at one point decompartmentalized to study how the NHI interact with the craft. The NHI are linked to their craft in a way that borders on biological. The actual way they interface with the components of the craft is not as sophisticated. Take this video. Although it's an immature video, the way he interfaces with a piston that moves the gas pedal is similar, albeit much simpler, than the way NHI interact with their craft. They send signals using their body to systems that control the craft. It's hypothesized that they can and prefer to control craft remotely, but I'm not sure if we were really researching this. Take note that if the driver of the jerry-rigged death trap in the video panics, the car would accelerate due to heightened brain activity. When people wonder how a super intelligent being can crash, this is part of the answer in conjunction with the navigation system malfunctioning. I personally don't think the NHI feel stress as we do, but if they heightened their activity and overrode the pathfinding system instead of letting it do its job, there could be an accident. A smaller subset of this wing focuses on how humans can interface with craft that are currently in the sky. If you see an image of a large disc above a gas station in the snow, it was someone in this department summoning a craft, not unlike how cheap RC car controllers can interfere with each other when used at the same time. Some people are better suited to interfere with NHI craft than others. We're not sure why. On somewhat comedic note, one colleague was harshly punished for using this research to encounter NHI craft at a party. There was an outdoor bonfire, alcohol, and questions about what she did for work. She wasn't killed or anything, just called a dumbass and told to never ever do that again. Some people in this department are BYU graduates who believe they are directly interfacing with what were recorded in the Bible as angels. There is an even smaller subset of this wing that focused on NHI communicating with humans. All I know about them is that they did that work at some juncture, but probably have other jobs now. Crash recovery probably has the most people involved. It's split up among several parent orgs, but funding is funneled away from it and into other departments when there's little activity. This is common among the entire agency as funding and staff get balanced between the different wings based on progress or lack thereof. Most of the crash recovery staff are staff from tracking and security that are involved in crash recovery. It's also made up of members of all of our favorite three-letter organizations. Crash recovery's overall structure was referred to as a volunteer fire department. It's typically some people playing pool and watching movies. But when the need arises, all hands on deck from the current staff and on-call members. Crashes are exceedingly rare. The number of crashes goes down exponentially because they learn to avoid the cause of the crash. When they crash, they make no effort to retrieve the debris, save for one instance. I personally believe some crashes weren't crashes, but were NHI parking a vehicle for us because there were no bodies recovered and the craft was in perfect shape. Security, to put it mildly, are terrifying. Imagine the very best of the SEALs, NSA, and Secret Service all working together. They are short-staffed, but that staff is not only elite, but dedicated. Their numero uno rule is people that mention the agency name are killed. It's not a question, and it happened during my time. 
You'll hear more about them as news about the retaliation Dave comes out. I wasn't directly interviewed by him, but I know several people who were. The security team figured it out quickly, and you could say they aren't his fans. They constantly monitor all discussions about the topic, but rarely act in real life unless absolutely necessary. They staff facilities like the second one I worked at. This team also actively engages in disinformation, gaslighting, and other similar campaigns. Their goal is to keep the U.S.'s secrets about this tech secret because other countries are close to breakthroughs. They also conduct counter intel on what other countries know and counter counter intel about what they know about what we know. Not to sound crazy, but the security team will see this at some point or another, so a friendly hello to them can't touch this, but I sure hope. I have a hunch that the current public-facing task forces are actually their own wing within security. A friend of mine texted me once, Sean Kirkpatrick, you can get your ass kicked. Ha, huh. don't confuse these public-facing task forces with the work Dave and co. are doing. Dave is the real deal. I should mention that leadership is kind of its own wing. It's not on paper, but they operate above all of the other departments. Leadership is made up of managers who pay close attention to each wing, they discuss info they know, and bring up contradictions to upper managers. I don't know how far this chain goes up. I reported to someone who reported to someone. I believe it goes higher than that. I have no idea who is at the top or what their credentials are. I suspect they're in the private sector, with their bankroll disguised as R&D for government contracts. Leadership, honestly, made the right choices with the information they had, at least when I was there. Some bad people started to get in charge and change the way things worked among the middle managers and individual teams. This pissed people off and led to multiple catastrophes. As far as I know, they face no discipline, so that was exhaustive. Those are the wings of the agency that I knew about during my time there. It feels good to get this off my chest. I've been sort of keeping up to date on the topics coverage and mainstream media and want to give some of my thoughts on this. If the U.S. comes out directly and says, we have craft, we have bodies, it means we are on the verge of a serious global conflict like we've never seen before. They will only reveal this to the public if absolutely necessary. The way the information is going to come out is through people like Dave and further probing from Congress. Not all of it should be public information, but I believe the technology that is just sitting somewhere would completely revolutionize the way we live. I don't think anything significant will happen in my lifetime. It was a frustrating job because everything was so stagnant and had so, so much potential. We're talking about technology so advanced it could render every single current global issue obsolete. If we solved two major issues with the craft and were able to manufacture them, we wouldn't know what to do with ourselves. The technology being incorporated into our technical revolution is a hoax. I heard one theory from a guy at a bar that the transistors at Bell Labs were inspired by technology at Area 51. This is a joke. The technology makes transistors look like sticks and stones. I believe multiple species of NHI is misinformation spun up by the security team. There are mystery wings of the agency I didn't get to learn about during my time. It's possible one of these research is other species, but I doubt that. NHI potentially experiment on us and definitely experiment on animals. We have no idea why. The main reason you'll never see organized disclosure is because nobody can agree on what to say. We simply don't know enough. Namely, the NHI's intentions, sort of, we have a good theory, and where they are from. The anthropology wing believes the NHI are controlled by an intelligence that is beyond our current understanding of how life works. The biology reports conflict with this, which is why things can't be compartmentalized. If the government were to disclose info, they'd have to get the story straight. We also have no idea where they are from. Uh, we, as in everyone I worked with, it's possible someone in high up in leadership knows. I don't think the answer is as simple as another planet or caves on Earth. The reason why specific facility locations are kept from the public is because some of them are sensitive and also not entirely NHI researched based. It would be possible for some TikTokers and hippies to storm the first office I worked at if they were careful. Every place where the agency works is also home to other operations, which is why it's so hard to identify where they are. Lower leadership is HQ'd in DC. And the upper management is split between Nevada, Australia, and another foreign country. 
uh, security are everywhere and potentially even work remotely without an HQ. I was contacted by a documentary filmmaker when some of my friends were, but I turned it down due to my specific involvement and how easy it would be to track me down if I gave particularly juicy info. I believe the story will come out soon. I no longer work in the field and teach full time. After a quick proofread, that's my post. I'm not tuned into discussions other than what major outlets have to say, but I hope some of my information is interesting. Interesting. It felt good to type, even if my post doesn't get accepted. I, I feel tempted to sign off with my first name, how I always do in emails, um, but I have a feeling that would end badly. I'm currently on a camping trip with my family, but I'll be around to answer questions at various times. Please don't DM me anything too weird. Thanks for giving me an opportunity to talk. I've never done anything like this before. I'm sorry I couldn't provide information that proves who I am. I like not being paralyzed or dead. I'm sure you'll see others make the same claims in due time on one of Logan Black's Twitter spaces.